I have this belief that there's no such thing as the best. It's unachievable, it's depressing. When someone says they're the best, that means someone's the worst. Like, mm. there's this, it creates this divide. But there's a good thing like better. So like, I can do better. I can't do the best, but what does it look like to do better? And how do we just encourage that? What's the one thing you can do to be better this year? Welcome to the As One Leadership Podcast. Today's guest is an accountant. Now, I'm sure straight away you've got a stereotype in your mind. It's probably someone with dark black slacks all nicely ironed, a white button-up shirt with a tie, neat hair with a part, um, someone who's kind of dour, responsible. Um, you're sort of happy they're doing your finances, but you probably wouldn't invite them over for a dinner party, that kind of thing. Well, I want you to scrap that today as we talk to our guests. Uh, instead, if you're if you're watching this, you'll already see what's going on. But if you're not, if you're listening to this podcast, think big bushy beard, uh, slick back hair, outrageous fashion, whiskey drinking, party throwing, fun loving, uh, throw in family man with a loving loving wife and two daughters and a dog. Add to the mix entrepreneur, entrepreneur, award winning businessman, business owner, corporate speaker. Cap it off with a man of faith, and you have a summary of today's guest, Andrew Vanderbeek. Andrew, welcome to the S1 Leadership Podcast. Mate, that is the best intro I think I've ever received. Um, if you can just, can I get that? I'll get that recording. I'm going to play that to myself every night before when I get out of bed in the morning and every night when I go to sleep. That's good. That'll make me feel great. Let me tell you the story. Yeah. I was thinking about you as a guest on the podcast. Okay. Um, and I was laying in bed one night before I even approached you about it. I'm really disturbed that you were lying in bed thinking about me, but it carry is, on. It is kind of disturbing, but <laughs> I got that intro in bed. So I got up out of bed and actually typed it in my phone by faith, thinking that you hopefully you'd say yes to come on a podcast. <laughs> but I had the intro even if you didn't come. So I could have sent it to you regardless of whether you came on the show. Excellent. So. So it's great to see you, mate. Yeah, really good to see you too, mate. It's yeah. been um, it's been far too long since I've physically seen you. Yeah, so we knew each other quite well years ago um, through church and, and different things. Um, but I think when I used to know you, you were more kind of boy band than bush ranger. So what happened? Well, look, boy band. I, I play drums in a punk band, thank you. Like, I don't know about boy band. Um, Justifying it. Look, yeah. I guess life has been really interesting. So we, we knew each other when I was I was quite young. I would have been my, my early 20s, um, very early 20s. Um, uh, I had a career as an accountant at the time still, though. So I still was like going to work in a in a quite a large corporate accounting environment, still wearing a, sh a suit and tie. And then on the weekends, I'd probably put a pair of jeans and a T-shirt on kind of thing. But um, yeah, the last kind of... Let's call it ten years has been a bit of a roller coaster for me in terms of uh, career, in terms of business, family. Um, but I think it's like it's like an evolution of of who I am has kind of happened over that last kind of ten or so years, where you're a young adult and you're you're a young man and you're kind of growing and you're finding your feet and you meet a woman and you start a family and then you just kind of evolve from that. And I think where I am now is just a, a reflection of what life has kind of thrown my way over time, and the way that I've interpreted it is along the way too. Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting. Like if you were just a standard accountant, we probably wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. <laughs> yeah. So today I want to talk a little bit about breaking the mold. And I think you're a person who's done that really well because when we think of leadership, like this is the As One Leadership podcast, you often think of a particular type of person with a particular type of you know, style and yep. look and it's kind of cookie cutter, you know, every yeah. leader's a bit like that. Yeah. But we all know that every leader's different, you know, you've got different um, skills, values, passions, abilities, all that sort of stuff. And so, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to you a little bit about breaking the mold as well as a bunch of other stuff. But before we do that, um, let's get your journey in the bank. We want to hear a little right. bit of your journey. Take us back a little while. So you've mentioned and I've mentioned that you're an accountant. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your journey uh, into accounting. Why accounting? Yeah, look, good question. Um, uh, why accounting? I was good at maths. I did accounting at school and one day I was looking in the newsletter and the school newsletter had this um, like a little advertisement somewhere they talked about what's referred to as a cadetship. So it's like doing a trade apprenticeship but white collar style. I was like cadetship with this big four accounting firm, apply now. And I went, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll apply. I jumped online. Oh, I have to apply tonight. It closes tonight. So I applied for it. Um, I was successful in getting an interview and then a few interviews later, all of a sudden I had this job and I kind of liken it was probably the first ever and probably the last ever public school kid from Frankston who uh, <laughs> got admitted into that, which was, you know, I, I kind of wear that as a bit of a badge of honor, but um, um, I got into it purely from an understanding of that numbers for me made sense. I liked problem solving. I liked coming to an a, 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 like a, a result and I liked there being a, a right and a wrong answer. That was really, really kind of good for me the way I worked. And then I fell into it with this big four accounting firm and then fast forward, what, 15, 16 years now um, and I'm still doing it, although it looks 
very different from when I was um, – I kind of did it that, that first. Like I remember the f- – I think the first thing I did for – or the only thing I did for six months was just photocopy documents, mm. which you don't really do now because everything's in the cloud. You don't have paperwork. But it was just standing at the photocopier, here's reams of paper, chuck it all through. And that was me learning how to be an accountant mm. back in 2003. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like my apprenticeship as a carpenter, but I wasn't doing photocopying. I was sweeping floors and yeah. digging trenches. And yeah. you got to start with that stuff, don't you? Well, it's you? funny though because that stuff still has to happen. You still have yeah. to sweep. You don't photocopy paper anymore. So yeah. the accounting industry is trying to figure out, well, how do we teach young accountants to be accountants now when we can't give them reams of paperwork to photocopy that they see what this document is and they ask mm. questions about these things. So it's it's a bit of an interesting kind of place to be in as a young person looking to, to move into a finance kind of uh, career. Mm. So how long did you work for that firm? I was there for six years. So I studied my uh, my degree um, at RMIT University and I got three quarters of the way through my chartered accountant's qualification, which is a nightmare fun to complete. <laughs> uh, and then the GFC hit, um, which... Uh, I didn't really understand that. And I probably should have as an accountant, but I didn't really quite understand. We were carrying on and there was a round of redundancies and we kept going. And then uh, I remember one day I was in at work. It was just a finished lunch, got my lunch, phone rings, partner in the office, hey, can you come have a chat? And I knew straight away exactly what that was. Mm-hmm. Um, so I walk in, they're like, we're really sorry, um, but we have to make some further redundancies and unfortunately that's going to be you. And I'm like, but you can't, but I've got a contract, but you can't. It was this whole, you can't do this. And they're like, we can. Mm-hmm. And they slid a bit of paper under my nose and it, had a number on it that they were going to pay me out because of the redundancy. And I went, eh, you know what? Sure. Because yeah. <laughs> I realized I had this like resume, like I'd yeah. been somewhere for a period of time and I'd, I'd learned a lot. And I knew that that place I was working at was, you know, one of the biggest four accounting firms in the world that I could walk in with that on a, on a resume and I probably could get a job most other places. Mm. So all of a sudden the shift that I started realizing there is I've lost this job. I don't have a job. I've got a cool story about that in a second. I'll tell you as well, but I lost this job, but Hey, I, I am almost in a position of power now because a lot of people are going to want someone like me who's in their early 20s, who's got six years working in a high quality accounting firm who can step into a role and go from day one. Uh, The cool was um, my wife had been looking for a job for about a year. Um, Her mother, who's now passed away, had some uh, illness um, issues and she'd actually quit her job to care for her mum for a while. She'd been looking for work, looking for work, looking for work. And I remember calling her and saying, I've just lost my job. She was my my fiancé. Fiancé? Fiancé at the time, I think. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, And I'm looking for – I just lost my job. And she's like, it'll be okay. Don't worry. Be fine. And I'm like, okay, cool. And half an hour later, she calls me back and she's like, you never believe this. I'm like, what? She's like, I just got a job. Mm. Like, a, like half an hour after I lost my job, she got a job straight away. And it was this really cool like, oh, it was that moment where I went, I think I'm going to be fine. <laughs> like I think I'm going to be fine. Like this isn't as big as it looks. Like we got years ahead of us. We'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Excellent. So you worked for that firm and then you lost your job there. Yep. Did you go to another firm after that or did you go straight to starting a business? No, no, I went to another. So I was, I was like 23 at, the, at that time. Um, I got a job offer for another, another CBD-based accounting firm and I kind of was thinking there, like, do I really want to work CBD accounting? This more corporate approach, the suit and tie, is that who I am? Like I grew up on the Mornington Peninsula, which is what where people from Frankston like to say they're from because it's technically not the Mornington Peninsula, mm-hmm. but I grew up on the Mornington Peninsula. <laughs> um, and I always envisioned that I would eventually end up back down there some someday. So I'm like, if I keep building this career in the city, I'm not going to end up down there. My uh, girlfriend, now wife, um, Avada, she lived down that way as well. So it was a challenge in terms of travel. Um, so... Uh, I made the decision that I wasn't going to accept any roles in the CBD. Mm. Um, I went to Bonnie Doon, of all places, with mm. my best mate and, and, our, and our partners. And we're sitting around and we're saying, well, where would you like to work? And I'm like, well, when I was a kid in high school, I did like this uh, work experience for like a week at this accounting firm. And I really enjoyed it. So I reckon I'd really like to work there. And I kind of spoke that out loud and um, got back from Bonnie Doon, phone rings. It's a recruiter. Hey, blah, 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 Andrew, um, I've got this accounting firm. We'd like to have a conversation with you. Oh, who is it? Said the name. It was the person I said two days oh, before. Oh so all of a sudden I had this job interview with an accounting firm that was in on the Mornington Peninsula that I did work experience and I said I think I'd be interested. Um, and a week later I had a job. Um, and it was this weird, like this, like a, you kind of think of coincidences, this weird flow of like I saw this letter that I had to, uh, when I was in high school, to apply for a job. I had like 12 hours to complete an application that I'd never seen before. Against all odds, I got that job. I got made redundant the same day my wife gets a job. Mm. I then speak out loud at an accounting firm that I'd like to go and work with and then a week later I've got a job offer. Yeah, that's awesome. It's just a weird flow. 
I call them God incidences. I like it. God's working in that. So yeah, right. It's no coincidence. The God yeah. incidence, and He knows what He's doing. So, yeah. so that's really cool. So, um, I really like the fact that you said, you know, you in the CBD, big accounting firm, you had other opportunities in the CBD, um, but you said, I don't want to do that. That's not what I'm. That's not who I am. Because yeah. most people would think, well, I have to do that. I've got to put on a suit and tie. I've got to go, and that's what accountants do. Build a career. Like, yeah, and there's, a career. there's a lot more opportunity to build a certain type of career in the, oh, in the, the ladder, industry. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. And I love that you sort of looked at yourself and said, who am I? That's not me. So mm. if I keep doing that, I can keep doing that. I'm capable of doing it, but I'll end up being someone that I'm not and yep. I won't end up where I want to go. And so you made a hard decision at a probably a pretty pivotal time to go and step away from that and go and pursue what, what I think I'm meant to be doing. I really love that. And I think that's, you know, part of the breaking the mold yeah. early on. You know, you're still in the suit and tie, but you're breaking the mold. So I hadn't even of, thought about it until you just said it there. But yeah, yeah, no, you're spot on. I just, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So you worked a few more years with a firm? Yeah. So I was at this firm on the peninsula and they were more small business. And and what I kind of realized that I've been reflecting on recently is that my appreciation and love for accounting had waned. Mm. I'd been burnt because I got made redundant at this large accounting firm. So effectively, I got told that I wasn't good enough was the way that you, you receive that when you're in that environment. Mm. And I was working this smaller one and I was working, I was doing the work, but I was just like, it's just... It's just a document with numbers on it. Like all I'm doing is a transaction. Like this is crap. Um, until I realized there's a person behind the transaction because I'm doing it for a business and a business is run by a person and a person has a family and they have dreams and all these things. Mm. And I started going, well, what if we could do accounting that wasn't transactional and we could do accounting that was relational where we actually understood what our clients wanted, not just for their business, but in their personal lives. What do mm. they actually wanted in life? And what if we could deliver an accounting service that actually did that? Now, this isn't revolutionary and what I'm learning is that everything that I probably think about, act and do right now has been done 10 times over over the last 100 years. It's just been my revelation of that. Mm, yep. um, so I, I made that decision to go, I think I think I want to do that. And this, the, you know, the other part of it at that point in time as well is so, you know, Christian guy with faith. I was like, I'm not sure this is the best environment for me to be in mm. because there's some things and some ways that the leaders of this organization are running that I'm not comfortable with. There was a particularly dominant person who is very obviously dominant in there. And I'm, I'm like, I, if my next step is to move into some level of ownership eventually, mm. I don't think this is the right person. And how do I, as someone who's faith, kind of live out values that I have in the accounting mm. world? So I, I sought out some some mentoring. I spoke to the pastor of my church. I spoke to someone else that I knew. And I said, do you know an accountant that has a bit of maturity about them, a bit of experience that I could maybe come alongside and they could you know, give me a bit of a guiding hand? Um, and they introduced me to a, a gentleman by the name of Jason. Mm. And a month later, we started a business together. Yeah, wow. Just at the age of 26. So is he an older guy than you? Or? Yeah, so he's 10 years older than me. Yep. So Illuminate, um, as it is today, looks different. Jason's no longer around. He's, he's, he's got other activities he's involved in. Still a mm. good friend of ours. Um, but it was we caught up for a coffee and we very quickly realized that what we were both looking for at that point in time was each other. Mm. I was looking for someone with a bit more maturity, a bit more seniority, someone who had um, the ability to kind of guide and do a bit of mentoring. And he was looking for a go-getter. He was looking for someone with a bit of professional background and experience, someone who had similar values, who could effectively go and run with the stuff that we needed to. Yeah. Um, and it was literally like within, a, I think it was about a month, we decided we're starting a business. We, we kind of set up a couple of things, made a few decisions and away we went. And I can, I remember, sitting in the office, uh, like I, I kind of left a letter in my boss's office and he called me in and we had a chat and he's he's like, so what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I am started an accounting firm. He's, he's like, <laughs> like the look on his face was like, it, it just was, it was very like, you are not good enough. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. Who do you even think you are? Mm -hmm. It was very belittling. And, and to some extent, I guess rightfully so, like who in their right mind at the age of 26 thinks that they're capable of advising businesses on taxation and accounting needs? Like it's, it's rare. You, you often have to build up experience and reg, a resume to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wasn't trying to do transactions. I was trying to build relationships and I knew I was good at building relationships and I knew I was good at getting alongside people. So I went, stuff it, let's do it. Yep. And then that was almost eight years ago to the day. So it was uh, about a month ago, we had our eighth birthday. Yeah, awesome. um, and all of a sudden we're here now, which is just crazy. That's amazing. So it's Illuminate is your, your yep. business? Yep. Illuminate with the number eight. We, 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 I really like the idea of like just making it a little bit confusing. So people of certain generations go, sorry, how did you spell that again? <laughs> um, really fun when you're talking to someone on the bank over the phone and you have to say it over and over again. Yep. Um, and we decided on like we wanted our business. So we, Jason and I, we wanted the business to not be about us. 
So we wanted, didn't want to have it like Vanderbeek and Co or something like that because then we couldn't get other people involved in it. We, if we left, what would happen to the brand that we created? So the decision very early on was we want to create something that has longevity, mm-hmm. something that has sustainability, something that can be passed on and that other people can buy into. And as a result, it can't have our name. And Illuminate just happened to be um, the name that Jason was trading under at that point in time. He'd had a bit of guidance from someone in the marketing space and had a bit of a realisation and he really liked the name and he was starting to trade under Illuminate. And he's like, what do you want to call? I'm like, to be honest... I love this name Illuminate. It's shining light. It's revelation. It's mm. truth behind. It's like how do we – like? I think I really like the idea of that. Let's just go with that. So all of a sudden we were an accounting firm that was run by a 26-year-old. I didn't have a beard at the time. Um, <laughs> or, like an accountant, Or as many. Right? I looked a bit more like an accountant. It's funny that I, I put a photo up on Facebook the other day of like a photo of me day one. And a photo of me six months ago before I trimmed my beard because it was all the way down here. <laughs> and it literally looks like some dude who's trying to model a watch and a guy that's homeless. Um, <laughs> but it's the, the transition's funny. Yep. But yeah, so we went with Illuminate. And um, and it's um, actually probably one of the best things we ever did because mm. we can wear a T-shirt that says Illuminate on it and you don't look like you're an accountant and your clients want to wear the T-shirt because it looks cool and your mates want to wear the T-shirt. So all of a sudden you're building a community that doesn't have to say accounting on it Mm. um, and they feel like they're a part of it still. Yeah, so once again it's just being yourself. It's embracing not necessarily what everyone else says you should do as an accountant but what's important to you and the kind of person you are. I think that is – I think the best businesses are those sort of businesses that they're built on the uniqueness of the people rather than just this is what it has to be. So I really love that. So it's – about eight years ago now you started, so yep. obviously a lot's changed, not just you look physically. Yep. Um, you know, someone did something for me recently with the – we planted a church five years ago and what I looked like when I started and now, you know, I've got grey beard. I, I feel like you don't really age all that much though, yeah. mate. Like I reckon when I met you, I was like, yeah, this guy's about in his 20s and you're like, I don't know, you were much older than I thought you were. I'm like, get out of town. <laughs> I think the grey hairs betray me now and the, you know, it's receding and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, things change. So eight years down the track, what does Illuminate look like now? It was you and Jason. Yep. What is it now? So now we're a team of 14, almost 15. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, bought my business partner, Jason, out uh, just under five years ago now. Uh, mutually beneficial. He had other things that he wanted to do. Um, we have won multiple awards. Um, I find myself speaking around the country internationally on topics that are more about authenticity and purpose and values, but in the accounting industry. Mm. Um, we work predominantly with small businesses who want more than just a transaction, mm. um, family-based businesses. We don't deal with big, big businesses because we can't get a personal relationship with that. Mm. This lovely golden question that we have, which goes, um, if you could do one thing tomorrow morning, regardless of time, money or location, with no restrictions at all, when you get out of bed, what would you do? Mm. And that's the crux for everything we do. We still keep people out of jail, as I like to say, by lodging documents on time. (laughs) But we do it with a a bigger story. So we do accounting, we do bookkeeping services, we consult on technology and efficiency and systems and processes, and we deliver business advisory where we help people and guide them through what it is they should be doing, whether it's connecting them to other professionals or helping them to do it themselves. Mm. Um, It's just great. So we're we're based in Mount Eliza. Um, We've got a second space in Moorabbin. Um, and the last three months, we've all been working from home, yeah. um, which we could do day one without hassle because we're a fully cloud-based accounting firm. So we don't yep. have paper. We just have a lot of computer screens and cables mm. is really <laughs> what we have to manage. Yeah, okay. Mm. So I was going to ask you, the next question was, you know, how does Illuminate look different to a standard accounting firm? So you've talked a little bit about it sounds broader than that. It's yeah. more relational. What are some other things that make it different too? Yeah, and, and look, before I get into it as well, like I've got massive respect for all the accounting firms out there. I think... Um, the accounting industry, particularly in the last three or four months, has been a really hard place to be in because of the volume of work we've had to deal with with uh, government changes around financial stuff around COVID. So I've got a lot of respect for people. There are many great tax and accounting minds out there. Um, but our approach is the person before the accountant. So what you see is that person. I'm not an accountant called Andrew. I'm Andrew who happens to be good at accounting. Um, so that is our number one differentiator. It's the person, who you're interacting, what environment we're creating. Um, we have a party every year. And at our party um, last year, we had 
Um, we had a big pizza truck. We had, um, you know, Mario Kart on a big screen. We had a whiskey and gin tasting because I'm a massive, massive whiskey fan. Um, and we had a tattoo artist doing free tattoos all night long, real tattoos. And oh, we had right. like 30 people get tattoos. You had half a dozen people get their first ever ones. We like So our vibe is like, let's just be ourselves and create an environment where people can be who they are, mm-hmm. regardless of where they've come from or what they're about. As best as we can, how can we be non-judgmental? But also how can we bring a, an approach of purpose? So that's a big differentiator is the fact when you walk into our offices, you'll see T-shirts and jeans and beards and tattoos and maybe some loud music, maybe some soft music, depending on who chooses the music for the day. (laughs) Um, But you'll also see something a bit more where we're fully cloud-based and we have been for eight years. Mm -hmm. So we know the technology inside and out. We're not learning it. We're on top of it. Um, You know, I sit on the advisory board for Xero um, for their um, their advisory council for their um, accounting practice and Mm -hmm. bookkeeping practices. Um, We we spend a lot of time doing that kind of stuff. So when people work with us, um, there's a lot of digital connection involved. Um, So we can maintain connection with people even when we're not with them. Whereas, um, you know, traditionally uh, accountants would speak to their clients once a year when they do their tax return and maybe again when the client forgot to pay their bill. Mm-hmm. And that's that's normally the engagement. We're so much more engaged, so much more connected um, and we just we ask a lot more questions. The number of times I've had clients or prospective clients crying in my office with the door shut on the couch about stuff, mm-hmm. it just blows my mind and it realizes that we're not just doing accounting. It might be what we do and what we get paid for, but it's more than that. It's creating a community um, of small business owners who just want to just do better. Because mm-hmm. I, I have this belief that there's no such thing as the best. It's unachievable. It's depressing. When someone says they're the best, that means someone's the worst. Like mm-hmm. there's this, it creates this divide. But there's a good thing like better. So like I can do better. I can't do the best, but what does it look like to do better? And how do we just encourage that? What's the one thing you can do to be better this year? Um, we released a guide um, last year called the the Guide to Better Business because um, we just believe there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Mm. Um, and with that, you get confidence and you feel better and away you go. Yeah. So I guess that's you know, the diff- core differentiator for us is um, it's a person, not an accountant. Um, and I guess the the attitude, the vibe and the way we go about things is just you you wouldn't – most people who work with us for the first time go – what? <laughs> Hold on, what? This like you're having a party and I can come to a party and we can hang out and yeah, cool, come along. Like whatever. We're very, very relaxed. Well, I must admit I saw on Facebook photos of the party and I thought, gee, I need to get a new accountant. You do, mate. One Watch on the out. Peninsula, I reckon would be really good. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously I wanted to talk to you about breaking the mold. I think you've talked a lot about that already in, yeah. in different ways, but I guess I just changed tact a little bit with the question. Um, when it comes to breaking the mold, how much of that do you think has been a deliberate decision and how much of it has been just you naturally evolving as a person and pivoting kind of as you go? Yeah, look, it's a good question because the word authentic is like massive fad word mm. and it has been for about a year mm. or two um, and it happened to work for us that we became authentic and started living our life out about four years ago. So when um, when I bought out my business partner, Jason, I found myself standing in my office going, all these things aren't working. We're not making enough money. We're not working with the clients. We're not, Jason, why aren't you? And I'm like, hold on, the, the guy ain't here anymore. Stop trying to blame other people. And maybe I realized maybe I was trying to blame him for things when we were in business and maybe that's certain reasons. So turn the finger around, point it at yourself. You need to take responsibility for this thing. And I was like, for what? Like, Who are we? Like, how do I know what I'm taking responsibility for if there's nothing defined, if there's no expression, if there's no understanding of what it is? Mm -hmm. So our journey was a journey of discovery. Who, in fact, are we as a business and as an organization? And then how do we live that out? And we're probably facing three fears at that point in time. So the fear number one was, what if we say this is who we are and it's not actually who we are? And what we've done is we've just got caught up in a marketing machine because being authentic is a fad. Apparently, it's a fat word. People are trying to be cool. Let's take a photo with like, you know, artwork in the background and pose and <laughs> like that's not who you are. Mm-hmm. So so for us, we're like, well, we need to be careful to make sure that we are representing who we are. So the fear is what if we get it wrong? Fear number two is what if we get it right and no one likes it mm-hmm. because everybody expects their accountant to be wearing a checkered shirt, slacks, maybe no tie, and that's who they expect. Um, But the last fear was probably the biggest one. And the the biggest fear that I had, and it's a positive fear, is like, if I don't do this, what will I look back on? Mm. My fear was like not living out what I feel we should be living out. 
Um, and I was dead set scared of it. Like if I have to put on this mask every day and mm -hmm. pretend to be this person that everybody thinks I am, what kind of person am I going to be eventually? I'm going to forget who I am. Um, there's a great line that I like to refer to in some of my, my, my speaking stuff is like, um, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole realization of like, okay, let's just forget everything we know and let's understand who we are. We are as Illuminate and then understand who I am as, as Andrew. And we had a great person that came and facilitated um, some sessions with us to help to unpack that. Who are we? Who do we work with? And where do we go from there? And from then, it's just been a natural evolution of that, of this – I kind of refer to it as that coming out of the closet moment. Mm. So all of a sudden we're like, hey, this is who we really are. And everyone was kind of like, oh, cool. And people who were working with us were like, we, we already knew that. <laughs> you just weren't displaying it publicly. You weren't, it, your website didn't show that or certain things. Now you're just being yourself. We, we've, that's why we work with you anyway. Um, so for us, that authenticity, that brand, that personality, the approach and everything we do, um, I was very conscious of not forcing it. But I like to say that we make a lot of very good, bad decisions or bad, good decisions, however you want to look at it. Like things that in, in, in its sole contents, you look at that and say, that's a stupid thing. What are you doing that for? But if you look at that in a broader context, you, you look at that and you say, that's actually just who this business is. Mm -hmm. They have tattoo artists at parties because they want to have fun and their clientele thinks it's and, – and it makes their clients feel great about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so they, we do things that might not necessarily be the norm – but we do it and we have a whole bunch of fun whilst we do it because why would I want to run a business that forced me to be something that I wasn't so that every day I get out of bed, I have to go, <sighs> okay, cool. Andrew, you're an accountant today. Away you go. Mm -hmm. Why do I want to get out of bed and be like, sweet, I'm just going to work. Mm -hmm. Catch you later. This is who I am. I want to put the clothes on that I feel like wearing that day. I want to be in an environment with people that I can talk about things freely without – being told to be quiet or that's inappropriate. Like I've been, I've been told great stories of friends of mine who work at accounting firms who got told, can you not wear that um, that singlet under your shirt? I can see the outline of it. Or, <laughs> hey, I know that you can pull off wearing that blazer, but no one else here can. So can you not wear that? Because it'll encourage people to wear something different. We only wear suits, shirts with ties. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm um, like, how, like, that's just trying to tell someone to be like them. Yep. We always say when cookie we cookie cutter. Yeah, we're to be the same. Yeah. When we say when we're hiring people, I never want to hire an Andrew mm. because that would be a bloody nightmare to start with. But also, there's no such thing as another Andrew. I want to hire a Luke. I want to hire a Jess. I want to hire. I want to hire these people because when I hire them and I bring them into our team, they add to our culture, they add to our brand, they add to our identity, and we can't become better because of it. Instead of just a replica. Um, and I feel like in many industries, and I think accounting is one of them, is that you can have that copycat cookie cutter approach what do i need to be successful okay i'll go and do that mm. and then what it is is we just hear the same message over again and it just becomes white noise it becomes blanked out because no one has a different opinion no one has a different perspective rightfully or wrongfully but we're not engaging potentially in a good robust discussion about a topic mm. that actually would improve the industry improve our clients improve the well-being of our people because we have to follow the 12 step process to becoming a million dollar accountant. Yep. Don't get me started on business coaches. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's really good what you're saying. Cause I, I was just talking recently in a, in a message about the fact that we often surround ourselves with people just like us. And so we get in an echo chamber where we all believing in saying the same things. And so yes. we think we're always right because we're surrounded by people who always agree and we don't actually surround ourselves with people that are different. And, you know, as a body or a company or whatever, mm -hmm. you need different parts to play mm -hmm. different roles. Mm -hmm. And so if you're just recruiting people just like you, you get this very vanilla, uh, ineffective kind of organisation, church, yep. whatever it may be. And so you've got to try and find those people that are different to you. But something you said a moment ago really um, resonated with me because I think there's a lot of people that, that do just go through the motions their whole life. They're, yep. they're going and they're... They're becoming a person during the workday that they're not, you know, on the weekend or whatever. So what would you say to someone about, you know, someone who's going through that, what would you say to them about making a change? Where, where would they start with something like that? Oh, gee, that's such a broad – it's a broad question. And and um, so I reflect on this. I, I, I spoke uh, a few weeks ago on the topic of value and how being authentic can bring value. But I, I paused through it because I recognise that I'm a white man in Australia – who can really do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. I can be authentic. I can be who I am. I'm not a, a, a woman. I'm not a person of color. I'm not a person with different sexual habits. Like I have ultimate freedom to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really easy to say, hey, champ, just get out of bed and do whatever you want. 
But maybe in your situation, maybe you have a lot more pressure on you. Maybe there's a lot more expectation. Maybe it's family that assumes certain things. Maybe it's culture. Maybe it's the friendship group. Maybe it's just your work environment that expects that of you. So it's really hard, I think, f- for people to do that. And it's, I've been very lucky that I can do that myself naturally. But I think the core of it is when you're thinking about how do I start to make steps to change to become more authentic is you need to look at what do I stand for? What is it that actually gives me joy? What makes me happy? What are the things that I get out of bed in the morning for? And if for some reason that doesn't exist, what can I do to start make subtle change in that? Mm. And some of the bigger things that I've done in my life that have helped me to do that is to get good people around me. Now, you, you mentioned before, and I love that, like having the same people around you can be really good because you can get a bit of fanfare and cheer, but you don't get perspective. Mm. And for me... I've had a few people journey with me on an advisory board for a bit at a business level, but also on a personal level where I've said, Hey, I want to give you authority, not just, I want you to sit here and advise. I want you to give you authority that you can call bull crap if it needs to be called on me, but you can also encourage me when you're seeing those things. Cause you know who I really am. Mm. And sometimes I forget who I am because I get caught up with making money or I get caught up with um, what social media is telling me I should be, but you know who I am. So if you see me doing something that is not me, encourage me politely or firmly if you need to, that that's not who I am. Mm. So I think for me that was really helpful because I had um, a bunch of guys um, who would kind of say, hey, Andrew, I'm hearing these words come out of your mouth, but I know that's not your voice talking right now. Mm. So why don't you check that and have think about if that's is that how you would respond? So um, if you're looking to make that change, is there someone out there that knows you properly and do you trust them? And what kind, of, what kind of time do you spend with them? Is it just watching a movie, having fun, which is cool? Or are you intentional about saying, hey, I'd like you to help me kind of continue to be who I am and just give me a bit of accountability with that? Mm. No, I think that's so true. And I think they're the best friends, uh, whether it's, you know, advisors on a board or just friends. You want those people that can be your greatest kind of cheer squad at times but also yep. can bring that really sharp rebuke. And they're doing it because you know that, you know they love you. so They know it's the best thing for you. And it's it's yeah. so hard because you're like, can you just shut up? Like I don't want to I don't want to hear it. Like I just want to cruise and have to f- I just want to forget about stuff. But like the joy that I find that you get as you as it's it's like it's kind of like putting a puzzle together. I'm trying to think of an analogy that works here. It's like putting a puzzle together, but you don't have necessarily all the pieces. Um, like I, I'm, I'm teaching my, my six-year-old how to put a puzzle together. So they get the corner pieces and then we get the edges and then you get the things. And But you've got different pieces of puzzle that fit in there. Um, when you do it together, it's much easier to do it and you can work. But when you're doing it yourself, it, it might take a bit of time. So what are you doing to have other people so they can have perspective on what you're looking at? Hey, I actually have got a piece that goes there. And I think it's that um, – You don't know what you don't know. You can't see what you can't see, but other people can see that for you. Mm -hmm. But for me, I it was you have to verbally give authority to someone to do that. It's not one thing to be like, "Hey, I'm your mate. I'm just going to assume you're going to pull me up." But like, "Hey, I want you to pull me up. I I really want you to." Um, And if you're going too far, I'll let you know. Mm. No, very good. I think it's a good segue into criticism. Um, I've learned as a leader (laughs) that uh, if you're doing a good job, there's always going to be someone unhappy with you. And I think someone said once that. Criticism is the price of influence. So when you're having an influence, criticism is going to come with that kind of hand in hand. And um, that that can be really challenging. And I think as a leader, you develop thicker skin as you go, knowing that whatever you do, someone's going to be unhappy. And there'll be a whole bunch of other people that are happy at the same time and um, thinking you're doing a good job. So for you, I can only imagine... The accounting space, there's a stereotype. This is what you have to do. This is what you, the path you've got to take. Yep. You've just gone a complete, you know, almost 360 the other way and you're just being authentic and being yourself. I imagine that invites criticism from some parts. Have you, have you found that and have you struggled with it? Have you coped with it? Those kind of things. Look, um, yes. And I think also no. Yep. <laughs> so I think sometimes you think people don't like what you do mm-hmm. because you just assume that they're different. So part of the challenge that I have is because I want to live out myself and be who I am, I'm sometimes incorrectly assuming that other people don't appreciate it because they're different from me. Like I'm judging them mm. based on the things that I don't want to be judged on. So it's an interesting thing. But yes, I have. I just recently um, a poor fella on LinkedIn thought it'd be a really good idea to have a bit of a tirade on me. We, My team have been, had been working remotely. It was about eight weeks in. We were, we were in, in shreds. I was working till 3 a.m. seven days a week for two months straight just to try and help our clients. Um, as were a bunch of my team on similar kind of long hours. 
Um, and as a team, we gathered together and we talked about it and we had open conversations around how we feel now versus how we were feeling originally, what we can do together to support each other, what we can do to help ourselves, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know what? It was a really good experience. I'm going to share that on LinkedIn because I want to encourage other people to say, what are you doing to get around your team? So I did. And this poor fella, um, name will go uh, unsaid. If you want, just jump on my LinkedIn, you'll see it. Um, he thought that I was just a tosser is uh, probably a very kind way of explaining how he's... He just went on this tirade of just just calling me all kinds of things, assuming that I was just up myself and that the only thing that I should be doing is providing factual advice for my clients. Mm. Um, I originally thought maybe the dude had had a few too many bottles of wine or he's an accountant, so he'd maybe had a rough week, he'd been working too long. Um, and I learned that potentially that wasn't the case and maybe this is just who this person is. Mm. So you got to come across that. You do things differently. You think things differently. You're going to come across it. You're going to come across it publicly, but you're also going to come across it where you know it's happening, but you just can't prove it, i.e. you know there are people out there that for some reason are just not interacting with you the way they interact with other people. and that. So you, you get that. What I'm learning is what do I stand for and what am I here? At the end of the day, my business, the people who work with me and my family and friends close to me, they're the people that really matter at the end of the day. Now, I do have a role in the accounting community where I get to share and try and encourage um, and empower other accountants to step up and be more. Um, but realistically, at the end of the day, it comes back to what I'm actually doing. Mm -hmm. So the criticism often comes from other people who have no engagement or involvement in my business. So I'll listen to that. I'll go, is there, is there something, is there, is there any credibility in that? Maybe they're picking something up and going to the extreme of explaining it when they could have gone nicely and said, hey, mate, look, appreciate you putting the post probably a little bit too personal. Like you, you sound a bit up yourself. Mm -hmm. That would have been a nice way than maybe going full ball. Yep. So is there any credibility in there? Is there something I can learn from? Reflect back and say, is the fruits of what we're doing good? Mm -hmm. Because in the in the professional advisory space, the, the biggest... Um, like the biggest thing that will slam me down at any point in time is when someone doesn't want to pay your bill. Mm. Um, now, we price things are very different than the other accounting firms, but um, if someone says, I don't want to pay that, that's not them saying, I can't afford it. That's them saying, you're not worth it. Mm. And I take that personally because I'm like, I know we're worth it. Like we've spent years getting to this point. Mm. Um, so that criticism, criticism is like, okay, cool. But it's not that they, they don't think I'm worth it. Is it that they don't know I'm worth it? So how do I change that a little bit? How do I change that criticism from a, a matter of like, okay, maybe there are things you're not aware of. Maybe you're not um, fully educated on what this is like. Maybe I can reveal things and all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, okay, cool. Yeah, maybe you are worth it. Like let me open the car door and you can see the sound system. Mm. Oh, damn. Okay, yeah, no, nah, cool. That's worth it now. Mm. Um, so I think, I mean, criticism is always going to come. Whether you're um, – the same as everybody, whether you're different from everybody, it's just part of our life. And unfortunately, it's part of what social media is kind of brought out there. Mm -hmm. um, keep good people around you. Once again, get them to remind you that you are in fact doing a good job. Um, check in with your, like for us, professional checking with your client base. We try to check in quite frequently with our clients and with our, with, our, with our team as well to be like, hey, are we on the right path here? Like, are, are, we, is, are we missing anything? Are we doing something we shouldn't be doing? Mm -hmm. And if it's coming back overwhelmingly positive, just keep sticking the course. Yeah. Like you know the path you're on. You just get distracted by all these other things. Mm -hmm. Shiny and I, I, I always say I've got um, undiagnosed ADHD because mm -hmm. I like <laughs> glittery, shiny things and stuff pops up. I'm like, oh, let's go chase that. And ha people have to like grab me and say, no, Andrew, like we're heading this way. Yep. And I think that's cr what criticism does as well. Mm -hmm. You start to doubt yourself. You start to think, what if they're, what if they're onto something? What if it's true? What if everybody else thinks that? Mm -hmm. You know, oh, like like I traveled to the UK and spoke last year. What if, what if no one in Australia wants to hear from me again? Mm. What if, what if the only, like, what if one, people once they've heard me once, they don't want to hear me again? What if what I've got to share isn't really relevant? It's just catchy right now, and m maybe I don't have a voice. Maybe I don't have an opinion. Mm. I won an award two years ago, um, the Thought Leader of the Year mm. in the Australian Accounting Awards. Wow! It was an absolute shock. I didn't think I'd get. I I I had a couple of drinks too many potentially when I applied for it properly. Um, but I was still involved in the accounting industry and I won that award that night. And I remember I literally was like straight away going, oh, they got this wrong. Like <laughs> what is everyone's going to start looking at me and going, oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it, but it continues. There are people in the industry because um, another guy won it last year who's got a bit of a beard and wears jeans. 
oh, they only give it to blokes with beards and ripped jeans. Yeah. Maybe I'm just a guy with a beard and ripped jeans. Maybe I'm just what social media portrays is cool right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe what I have to think about isn't good, but it's going back to the core of the people that you connect with and going, hey, like, am I just running crazy here? Am I just lost in my train of thought? Mm -hmm. And they'll correct you back on. Yeah. What's the path? What do you? What's your, your mission? What are you? What are you trying to achieve? For me, at the end of the day, I want to build a business that allows me to open a whiskey bar. Mm. That's my number one goal. Um, so if I'm achieving that, why would I worry about all the stuff that's going on outside there? What is the core mission? I think there'll always be those doubts and fears and voices, and you got to learn how to filter those out. But also, I love what you say um, about listening to the kernel of truth in it as well. And I think mm. self-awareness for me as a leader is one of the, the most important things. And you only really grow in self-awareness if, A, you're willing to look at yourself and turn the mirror. Yeah. Turning the mirror is so important. But if if you're also willing to listen to the feedback and yeah. people's opinions and you sort of filter all that but you learn from it. And I, I love what you said before, you're still learning, you know, what I'm learning. You know, that sort of posture. Yeah. I want to be a lifelong learner and it sounds like you do as well. And if you've got that posture, you're going to keep growing and learning because you're open to it. You haven't arrived. You'll never arrive, but you're getting better. Like it's, a tough to, it's a tough place when you're a leader to do that though as well. It's like particularly I find in where I'm paid to give advice and tell people what they should be doing. Mm. So as a leader, people are looking at you to lead the way, to show the way, to teach them, to show them, all those kind of things. But as a leader, I'm looking at my people to, to show me. Like I, I want to learn from you. Like you're – you're the people that I'm serving. You're the people that I'm looking after. You're the people that are, that, are, that, are, that are connected with me. And I can't just be running away going, cool, we're just going to do this now. Mm. Like imagine if I said, hey, guys, so um, our accounting business, we've decided we're going to start manufacturing, um, I don't know, um, wigs and we're going to sell them because we think it's going to be good. I'll take one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I was going to say toothbrushes, but I've got a little toothbrush project on the side. So it would be a bad example. But like, like, so obviously people are going to be like, hey, mate, like I love the fact that you want to help Lukey with his hair. Um, but I don't think it's a good idea. Like we are good. We are accountants and business advisors. We're good at this stuff. Stick to what you're good at. Focus on that. Mm. And then you can expand from there. Yeah, you got to listen. you got to listen to people. Yeah, And it's really hard. When people expect you, but you, when your people expect you to be the one that talks, and there's a, a, a lovely saying um, that I, I always forget about, and then I have to write it on a piece of paper and stick it on the wall, is stop talking, start teaching, mm. and it's just this reminder of like maybe it's just all hot air, mm. and maybe I need to stop talking for a minute and think and go, am I actually adding any value here? Mm. Is it even worth me talking? Or maybe I should let them talk instead mm. because I'm going to learn because they're going to teach me something. And as a leader, I'll grow. And uh, at the end of the day, like our business is only strong because we have a team of leaders. Every single one of my team, everyone from the, the newest to the oldest person there, they all lead one aspect of our business. Mm. We're very, very flat, um, which is amazing because mm. um, it means that I don't feel like I have to carry everything all the time. Yeah. And when you know you have the support of that from your people and COVID attacks – you can work until 3 a.m. Mm. and it beats you up, but you know that the next day one of your team's like, hey, Andrew, are you okay? Like, what can I do to help? Mm. And I'm like, no, nah, it's cool. Like, I got this one from now. But you know, like, as soon as you're like, I'm going to take a week off, they're like, you take that week off. Actually, before I'm taking off, they're saying, Andrew, can you take a week off? We, we would like you to. Yeah. Like, you build that around your team. You stop talking so loudly. You start teaching. You start letting them teach. You learn from them. Mm. Um, I don't know. I feel like sometimes leaders – feel they have to be everything mm. and I've had moments of that where I'm like I have to be the guy and so you find yourself speaking over people mm. you're in a conversation someone have an idea and you're like no and like one of my my things is I often know the answer before a lot of people because it's the way I think I'm, I'm like I'm already here but I have to let people get to there otherwise they don't understand the journey that it took, took to get there I've maybe been thinking about this for three days mm. um, and they don't own it either I don't own it's it it's your idea but if they get there themselves, they, yeah. they feel like, I've contributed to this, I've inputted. But sometimes I feel like I'm the guy who has to go, Here, here's the solution, straight away, go. Yep. But nothing happens, no learning. Like, no, like it's a difference between delegating something and empowering someone. Mm. Hey, here's a thing to do. Hey, come, I want to sit down and show you how you can get it done. Mm. And then the next time, you don't even have to ask them, they just get it done. Mm. Yeah, I think obviously the greatest leader I think ever is a guy that you know of. His name's Jesus. He's not bad. And uh, yeah, I think he's you know characteristic of humility. Like you yeah. think about who Jesus was, like God in human form. Like you think, why would he need to be humble? He's like 
he's God, you know, but he displayed this incredible humility where he'd lay his life down. And I think what you were saying before about, you know, the people you work with as their boss, yeah. inverted commas, you want to learn from them. And I think that posture of humility, they're the best leaders because they're not just here with all the answers. They're actually learning, you're sharpening one another yep. and you're all growing together and you're kind of lifting everyone up at the same time. So I think that's a really great posture to have uh, even if you are kind of the boss or whatever you want to call it, the Absolutely. lead pastor of a church or yep. whatever it is. And I think Jesus modeled it for us and if it's good enough for Jesus, then it's certainly good enough for, for each of us. I kind of so. say like my number one role in business is to have broad shoulders. Mm. Why? So people can stand on it and take us where it needs to go. Yeah. I just need to – like I'm not carrying people. I need to just stand and go more because if I don't have broad shoulders and allow them to take this where it needs to go, it's capped by me. Yeah. And that's that's not a nice cap. We no. want more than that. Yeah, for sure. So you've talked a lot about some of the principles you have as a company. So if you could give us a, a few like pithy kind of sentences, these are the – the guiding principles, what would they be? Or words or... Look, we've got we've got fun things. So we call it MacGyver it, yep. um, which is like solutions, not problems. Yep. Um, uh, one of my favorite sayings is just because it's sexy doesn't mean it's sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, are you chasing something because it looks so good or are you building something that has a strong foundation? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're all about fun. Um, we have this youthful and playful kind of approach. So how can we be free? Like how can it be like you're frolicking in the, the field of daisies in your undies? How can you feel like that at work without actually doing it? Because that wouldn't be cool. Um, or maybe you could. Who knows what you do? Um, so you could it eliminate? We could. We have talked about having pants off Friday and just having like <laughs> okay. a coat hook with pants on there, but we don't have like screens in front of the desks and okay. we feel that probably wouldn't be appropriate. Probably not. No. Um, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like we have, we have some of these things, but like – the core of it is the golden question that I kind of mentioned beforehand. What would you do? We ask every single person um, who's going through the hiring process what their answer to that would be. Mm. And everyone's everyone's answer is different. Like one of my team, Sam, she loves horses and her dream would be to have some land where she can kind of rescue um, race horses and give them a life going forward. Mm. Um, Mick, who kind of leads our accounting team, um, he's big into kind of um, a war history. So he'd love to do a World War II tour through Europe. Mm. Um, uh, for me, I'd open a whiskey bar. Um, in a heartbeat. Um, so we've got a bunch of people with different things. So that's our crux. But like this whole, if I could sum it up into like three words, it's purpose-based accounting. Mm. So it's accounting, but it's what do you actually want out of this thing? Because your business and your life will control you if you let it. Mm. Your business will say you have to sell certain things, you have to market certain things, you have to make profit, you have to make money, you have to, rah, rah, you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to. And I say, well, what do you want to? What do you want to do? Not just win business, but what do you want to do in your life? Where do you want it to go? What's the thing in your bucket list? And then how can we create a business that gives that to you? Mm. And I think that's the shift and it's a mindset. And I've had that with a client recently who um, thought she wanted something and I challenged her on it and she didn't really react, react to it or anything. She kind of blew it off. But the next meeting we had, she's like, I've been thinking about what you said. I don't need to make a million bucks. I need to spend time with my family. Mm. Like I want to buy a horse and ride it every week. I can't do that right now because I'm working stupid amount of hours. Mm. So she changed a few things and within a month had quadrupled her sales. Mm. It blew my mind. Now, this is obviously an extreme example, but for her it's like she was just looking everywhere and it's like we'll use a horse analogy because she likes horses. Put the blinkers on. She was focused. She knew what she wanted. She knew the decisions she had to make. And all of a sudden she got the results. Mm. I think if you look at that in leadership as well, like sometimes we can be so concerned about everything that's going on and we think that we have to control everything Mm. as opposed to focusing on the core things that I need to do. So I've got three, four key people in my team that I should be mentoring or looking after Mm -hmm. and they will look after the rest of it. I'm not looking after everything. I'm what I should be caring about that. Mm. My, My role at Illuminate is head of purpose. Why are we doing what we're doing and how do we ensure people are aware of that? I'm not in charge of lodging tax returns. I'm not in charge of doing the bookkeeping, calling that. I'm not in charge of that. Other people look after that. So I think for us at the core, it's purpose-based accounting, understanding why you're doing it. Profit is good. Purpose is better because if you have something with purpose, profit will come. If you build it out of purpose, we talk about authenticity, people will eventually figure out you're just trying to make money. And they'll go and find someone they feel more connected to, which is why a lot of these conscious brands continue to pop up, whether they make any money or not, who knows. Mm. But the the phrase conscious living and ethical and authentic and all these kind of things, people desire it. They want it. Mm. They're sick and tired of being sold to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Are you familiar with the term bait and switch? No, but yeah. maybe. You put the bait out there and people think they're coming for one thing and then you switch. Oh, yes, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Bait, sorry, I thought you said bait and switch. I'm like, yeah. that sounds new. So you're really interesting. But what we've really got you here for is some free accounting advice, right? So <laughs> um, there's a switch right there. So COVID-19, you know, yep. it's um, not something any of us saw coming. No. It's been a big thing for so many people and lots of people out there have been affected. Maybe they've lost their job, they've yep. lost their security, they've had to use their superannuation, whatever it may be. Um, what... From a financial point of view, what do you think are some of the important things for people to help them come through a time like this? Oh, look, there is so much we could cover, but I'll, I'll shrink it down. Um, I am not glad of COVID and also glad about COVID. There are so many businesses starting to take their business for real mm-hmm. and not for granted. Like they just, they, people just assume, oh, I run this business and I'm like, whatever, who cares? Do I worry about cash flow? Yeah, whatever. Like... We're now seeing people actually look at their business as, I need to understand this thing. I need to know it. So the first thing that they should be understanding is what does it need to be doing? So if I want to have a life and a lifestyle like this, what does my business need to look at? So that's a personal budget. Run a personal budget. What does that look like? Great. I need $5,000 a month. What is my business doing to get me $5,000 a month? Mm. And you're almost reverse engineering it. And that, now that's, that sometimes can potentially cap what you do in business. But my view is purpose-based. What do I want it to look like? Therefore, what does it need to do? So definitely you've got that. Now, if you're stuck in the world of COVID, hopefully you're getting financial assistance from the government, JobKeeper, cash flow boost, state government grants, all those kind of things. And if you're not getting that, you should definitely talk to your accountant. And if your accountant's got no clue, find one that does, maybe Illuminate, who knows. Mm-hmm. Um, but you've definitely got that core. People say cash is king. And they say that most businesses fail because of cash flow, which is true, but that's the result. The cause is that they're not pricing their their products well. The cause is they're spending too much money on parties with tattooists. The cause is all these other, like all these other things that are happening that creates bad cash flow. Mm. So once again, look at what the cash flow needs to be and then pull back from that and say, what are the decisions I need to be making? And then understand what scenarios might be happening. What happens if, I don't know, say I run a, an entertainment business that, re- that requires people to come on venue that have, hasn't been able to till potentially next week where we can have mm-hmm. um, people to drink a beer without having to eat food? Well, what happens if only five people rock up? What happens if 10 people? What happens if, like, run those numbers and understand what the variables look like and it will help you to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the decision might be, that, you know what, it's actually not worth it because I've been running this business on goodwill, not profit. Yeah. Now, I talk about Purpose over profit. Purpose is good. We still need profit. You still have to have profit to, to, to drive that purpose. And there are far too many businesses, and a lot of these businesses are probably in more of that hospitality space and some of these things where people's passion comes out. Mm. It's like, I really like coffee. I'm going to open a cafe. Sounds like a great idea. No, it's not a good idea <laughs> because cafes you won't make money out of yeah. unless you have the magic recipe, which I even I don't know. Mm. So I think if we go to that, understand what you need. What 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 is what is a life of uh, appropriate level of comfort for you and your family look like? What does your business need to be generating? And step back and look at that. Yep. Run a proper cash flow. Ensure that you're understanding what those numbers look like, and get in better habits of budgeting and cash flow management. Yep. I say that as someone who's only really gotten good at that over the last kind of three or four years myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah. I've yeah. Accountant. It's like the plumber with a leaky tap, right? The accountant who doesn't pay attention to his business. That yep. was me, just before when I had the realisation of who we really are as a business. It happens. Yeah. So there you go. If you're watching, there's some good advice. Go and do that stuff. Do and Yeah, turn get things around a little bit. That's great. You'll get through this season. So and if you want other good advice, you can go and see Illuminate anytime. Get on the internet and you'll find these guys. So um, when I look at um, the things you're doing as a company, from afar it looks like a lot a lot of fun, like a fun place to work. Like I think of, you know, those movies with Google and you get slide, <laughs> you slide down to work and you think, you know, they're jumping around in ball pits and all that sort of stuff and you think that looks like fun. Um, but it looks genuinely fun to work at Illuminate. Yeah. So um, I wonder, you know, having fun's obviously a value for you. Yes. Um, but obviously working hard, you know, you've been doing a lot of hours in COVID and stuff like that. So how do you go about uh, keeping that, that principle of fun but how do you inspire them to work hard but also enjoy that kind of fun and balance in life? Yeah. I find it really hard to answer this question sometimes because I just said we just do it. We just – we've – We've just created an environment that encourages it. But let me talk about some practical things. Every single morning we have a stand-up meeting, which people probably would be familiar with. Yep. You stand up and you go around in a circle and you say, what did you achieve yesterday? What are you going to achieve yesterday? Are you stuck and do you need anyone here to help? 
And what was your win? What did you? What was your good thing? What we do is we track the thing you say you're going to say. I say today I'm going to um, complete tax return for Luke. The next day, what did you do yesterday? If I don't say I did the tax return for Luke, I didn't do what I said. Mm. We track it and if we get a certain percentage, money goes into a pot and they can spend it on whatever they want. Mm. As a team, we've decided that all of that money that we're raising are going towards um, bushfire relief, which we decided um, when the bushfires kind of happen, so, which is amazing. The team are sacrificing probably a few thousand dollars of fun mm. to help others. Yep. Awesome. So we have that aspect. Um, we also have an aspect I find of um, if Andrew does it all, no one's going to do it. So if I let other people do it and I, let, I allow them to take a bit of ownership on that, then they're going to go and do it. But the number one thing is every single person we hire, I said, this is not my business. This is your business. I'm just the caretaker. So you pay attention to what needs to happen here because one day there's equity on the table if you want it. Because I want to go and run a whiskey bar and I can't be running an accounting firm. Yep. And I'm 100% honest about it. Like I, I, we, we had two guys join equity at the start of this year. One was a 28-year-old 20, guy who runs all our tech stuff and the other guy's my age who looks after our accounting team. We started a bookkeeping business and we recognized that it was going to take a bit of a slog too. So the person that stepped in to get it started with us, we gave her equity for nothing. Mm. Um, like you have to... Um, you have to follow through on things, which is a lesson I learned about two or three years ago where we, ha we have a retreat every year. We go away for a few nights. We have a bit of fun. We, have a, we do what we call our op shop night where everyone gets 25 bucks and they have to buy an outfit in half an hour mm -hmm. and they have to wear that for the night. And we do a brown low vote and who wins. But we, we had some reflection time and it came back to me. It's like, Andrew, we need to see you follow through. You talk a lot. Mm -hmm. You don't do much of that. Um, and what I've started to learn is like you need to start saying, if you say this is your business, you need to show them that it is their business. You need to allow them to make those mistakes. You need to allow them to grow. And um, I, I find like how do, you, how do you create an environment where people feel connected, where they feel valued, where they go into that? You treat them like a person. Don't treat them like a billable unit. And that's what happens in a lot of businesses where someone is responsible for selling something, making something, and there's a dollar connection. You need to get X number of things done on X period of time as that is your worth. Your worth to me is what you can make me in money. Whereas my work, their worth to me, I, I see that is, is you're creating the fabric of this business. Our clients, we look after clients who have stayed with us for a number of years. If you can look after them, they will stay with us for longer and we'll have a better business. So I want you to bring your personality because when you do that, our people, our clients will want to work with you more. Yep. Um, and I think that's the core. <clears throat> Excuse me, the core is like you be yourself in an environment where we respect that, respect others, and we'll allow to see that to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's really like it's hard to describe exactly what it looks like, but like things we do. So we do walk, we do we do a thing called a walk and talk. Every fortnight. I will go for a 15 minute walk with every single member of the team individually over like progresses over a fortnight. And we don't talk about work. How are you doing? Oh, you're trying to buy that house. How's that going? Oh, how's the dog? Oh, I know your mum's not well, blah, blah, blah. We might dabble in something to do with work. And they ask me, how are you doing? How's he, like it's, and it's like this, like it's not, I would consider that my friends, um, but we're a team. We have this, this kind of team mentality where we can connect beyond the task that has to be done. And I think when when team members or employees or whatever you want to call them, they see that their boss cares, mm. like actually cares, asks them questions, follows throughs on things, supports them when they need help, gives them flexibilities when they need, they are willing to do the same for you. They're willing to step up, work a bit more hours, do something they might not be familiar with, um, take ownership on something that they might not be comfortable with just yet. Mm. Um, and I think it's it's you have to show them you care and you have to show them that you believe in them. Um, because I could give something to someone and say, hey, go and do this. And when they stuff it up, I can tell them they stuffed it up and then not give it to them again. Mm. What what have they learned? Yeah. They've learned that I don't think they're good enough mm -hmm. is all they've learned. Yep. So why would they try again? Yep. Why would they step up again? Uh, and that's once again, delegation and empowerment. That's a lesson I learned where I just threw people in without floaties and not knowing if they could swim. Mm. Understanding that more. Yeah, And then I think outside of that, be creative. What actually is fun? What actually is fun? Is going to a restaurant and having spaghetti bolognese for lunch on every Friday fun? Maybe. But is it? The op shop party sounds a lot more fun. The op shop party's fun. <laughs> like the, um, you know, just like, so we're, we're in, the, in running for a handful of awards at the Australian Accounting Awards, which are on this week again. Mm. 
Um, and because restrictions allow us to, we're going to a restaurant in their function room, 20 of us, and we've bought matching suits. Lumberjack red check suits. <laughs> Every single one. They haven't arrived yet. They, they, we're, it's three weeks, so they better flip and arrive. We're all going to rock up in the same suits yep. and have a bit of fun because don't take yourself so seriously. Mm. Like respect what you do, but don't be so serious about it that you can't enjoy yourself. Respect that that kind of space. So, um, yeah, we just try to have fun. Mm. And I recognize that like if I'm spending so much time with these people, I want them to enjoy spending time with me. I don't want them to go home. Like I'd rather them prefer to be home because that's where they should be, mm -hmm. but I want them to want to be at work. Yeah. And how can I create that environment that where they want to be? No, that's awesome. It's all in line with breaking that mold, you know, rocking up in the same suits. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fun. You know, if you just went to the wards and you you all wore your nice clothes or whatever, you just forget about that. But you'll never forget that night. You never forget the look on people's faces yeah. when you walk in and the buzz that happens. Oh wow, look at them. That's well, the thing different. is, it's a, it's a video award as well, so yeah, okay. they'll cut to us as a video, and there'll be twenty of us sitting there silently wearing the same matching <laughs> suit, and that people will be like, "So we just we just think it's fun. Yeah. Like we just think we'll enjoy it. Like, uh, like we do we do things every year. Uh, but if you've ever seen the Office the American yep. version, there's the Dundies. We do yep. the Golden Globes because it illuminates a globe. Uh, and we just give out silly awards. We get them handmade by a local um, artist who makes this real beautiful glass light bulb style awards. And everyone gets to pick what everyone else's award is and then we give them out on the night. And it's it's community. It's connecting. It's recognizing that like we only have so much time together. Let's make the most of it as opposed to let's ensure that you're getting your billable workout. Because yep. if we can be a bit more flexible, people will get the work done. Mm. It will happen. Yep. And if no, you don't great. think it's going to happen, you don't trust them. Yeah, you don't trust them. People see that. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, they won't have a go again. Nope. Yeah, uh, that's very good. Okay, so if you could summarize in one sentence what you would like your employees to say about working at Illuminate, what would it be? <sighs> a man of many words. Can you get into one sentence? Pretend I'm working at Illuminate. Yep. And someone just asked. I would me, love if like if if you if you came to someone and said, "I feel like it's a place that I can impart purpose in other people's lives." Yep. Awesome. Okay, so same question, but now for your clients, what would you like, in one sentence, your clients to say about being a client of Eliminate? Without them, I wouldn't be where I was today. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And we had a client say that to us just last week. So my industry is decimated and I'm fine and it's, it's because of you. Yeah. And we were like, what? You don't realise that the impact you make on people's lives sometimes. Mm. It's cool. That's awesome. Very good. So you've... I was going to ask you about your Christmas parties, but you've talked about that. The we tattoo, talked about it that. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, We're planning a big one when we come out of COVID. Yeah, how do you get on the invite list for that? No. We'll, we'll hook you up. Yeah. You, you need to spend a certain amount of money with. <laughs> yeah, <a lawyer>. okay. <laughs> so it's just the high end ones, right? Yeah, I don't make any money, mate. I'm a pastor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're, so you're a man of faith. I, I've known you, you know, in church days, and I've seen your faith work out, serving on music teams and upfront stuff, and and just being a, a great person and. I wonder how that translate. How how important is faith for you, and how does it kind of inform the way you run your business? Oh, this this is I was I've there is it's crazy how many people of faith you come across in your business life, mm. in the accounting industry. Like you, it's like you just walk into a room and you're like, "There's someone of faith here." <laughs> like I remember I, I I did a presentation once, and I got someone who reached out to me on LinkedIn. They're like, "Love the presentation," blah blah. blah. Do you happen to go to church? <laughs> and and I and I speak with some of these people, and I think there is there's so much that my faith journey has taught me in business and in life. Mm. That it's and and so I I I've also kind of part of a uh, a social enterprise that sells bamboo toothbrushes, mm. and we take all our profits and we give it to um, um uh, indigenous um, communities for health and hygiene solutions. <laughs> but it's funny there are people in that in that group that care so much about the fact that we're saving plastic from landfill. I'm looking at the person. I'm going, there is someone over there that we can help. Mm. And I think that's what my faith journey and experience has taught me is that there are people in this world that need that, that we can help. Mm. Uh, I was always going to say need help and then all of a sudden I feel like I'm assuming that they need help when maybe they don't. So the assumption is sometimes a difficult thing. But right. there are people out there that need help and I can help them. Mm. But how can I do that in a way that's loving and caring and shows that I'm actually here to help, that I'm not just trying to make money out? And I think... That's been my a lot of my faith walk and, and learning if that is and development of understanding as I've matured as an adult, as a man, as a father, as a, as a husband is like what what is really actually important here? Mm -hmm. What is the, like like I think about what is the worst thing that could happen? What what are, what do these people really need? What is it that should like 
because I, I you sometimes get so caught up in the the repetitive process of something, whether you're going to church on a Sunday or whether you're running an accounting business or whether you're making coffees, you kind of feel like you get stuck in the machine. Mm. And I think for me, faith has taught me that if we just become so repetitive, we lose the magic. We lose those moments of something where we can actually see, oh my gosh, did you just see that? Did you experience that? I think that's taught me in in business and in life that I need to be more open and be more connected with people. Mm -hmm. I need to, like that pastoral care element, Mm -hmm. making sure people are okay. And if they're not okay, that's all right. So we we talk about... um, Baggage, and this is a, probably a, something I've picked up through my faith walk. You know, I don't want you to leave your baggage at the door. Mm. I want you to bring it in. I just don't want you swinging it around and smacking people in the head with it, is all. Mm. So if you're not having a good day, that's fine. Don't have a good day. If you want to talk about it, I'm here, but I don't want that good day to hurt other people. Yeah. Yep. And, and I think that's what I've kind of learned through my faith is that, like, there are some incredibly strong values that we can take out of um, kind of what Jesus has taught us and what a whole bunch of stuff that we've learned through that and saying, well, how do I take that in a way that doesn't have to be biblical or Christianese or anything? Mm. How can I just be a person who happens to walk and shows that I actually care about you yeah. without me having to say it? Um, it's like someone saying, I'm authentic, I'm real. Uh, you're not. I care about you. Do you really? <laughs> like if you say it, do you really? say? It? What does our life look like where we can actually do it without having to explain what we're doing? Mm. And I think for me that's that's something that, I think my faith has taught me is that I have connected with other Christians and other leaders and over the past purely because of the connection, not because they said they wanted to connect with me. Mm-hmm. It just has happened. Yep. Much like you and I, like we connected, we've been apart, we've connected, like this, this, this life kind of stuff happens. It, it, if it feels forced, it feels fake. Mm-hmm. And I think my faith journey has taught me a lot of that. I've had experiences in life where I'm like, that just feels gross. Mm. That that experience on that Sunday or the Wednesday night or wherever it was, that didn't feel real. That felt like it was fake. Mm. God's real though. <laughs> but why did that not feel real? Yep. And I think that's what I'm taking here is how do we ensure that it's genuine that we're experiencing here? Mm. How do we ensure it's not marketing fluff? How do we ensure that people don't open the blinds and go, hold on a second, there's a puppet here behind there just pulling all the strings, trying to make it look like it's something different. I remember years ago there was someone, um, I was pastoring at a church and they were saying, oh, look, I'm not going to small groups anymore. And I said, why, why is that? And they said, oh, because it's just not authentic. You know, I just look at the people, looks like they've got it all together and it just doesn't feel real. And I said, it's an interesting observation and, yeah, we want them to be real, we want people to be authentic. But I said, I know you quite well, um, but if I looked at you, I would say you have your life all together. And so if you want authenticity in your group, you got to start by modelling it, you know. Yeah. And I think it, what what you're saying is you've actually got to be what you say you you want to be. You've actually got to model that for people, mm. and because uh, people can smell a fake a, a mile away, and you can say, oh, "I'm genuine, I'm authentic," but people can tell if you're not. And so it's, you've got it's to tough it. if you're not in a safe space. So you yeah. might be like, "I'm broken inside," but I don't feel comfortable to let people see that. Yeah. And it could be because that's what the world tells me, but it could also be I'm in a room and everyone's saying like, "Oh, I think." great i'm having a baby i'm getting like all this stuff could be happening and be like crap i don't want to tell someone that i'm thinking of like ending my life right now Mm. i can't share that because i'm just going to kill the mood of the room yeah so how do we create an environment where someone can say that Mm. how do we create an environment where someone in work can open like we have some of our team that openly talk about their mental struggles Mm. and we support them as a team but we don't make it overtly, oh, gosh, we better change everything for you because that's worse. Mm. That's worse is kind of going, okay, cool, we recognize that quick, everything changed just for this one person. Mm. All of a sudden they're like, oh, spotlight on me. Yep. And I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of that. Like like if we can create an environment where people can be who they are, then it can be free. But it's also like maybe that small group full of people, everybody else in the room was loving it. Everybody else was being authentic, was being real, was being who they are. And it just meant that that person maybe didn't work in that space. Yeah. It's like if I, a client knocks on my door, I had one today, they they say, hey, we'd like your help. I'm like, you are not going to fit. Mm. We had another one the other day, a friend of mine said, oh, I referred someone to come and work with you guys. But they said they looked at your website and they're like, I don't like that. I'm like, good. Mm. Like good marketing divides. Yep. Groups will not fit certain people in. Yeah, and exactly. that's not, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's okay, isn't it? Like we, a broader yeah. community should be welcoming, but tighter communities, it's harder to have that. 
So how do we ensure that we're creating communities that are reflective of other people? Yep. I've always said since we started Follow that Follow is not the church for everyone. That's okay because some people go, I don't like that. There's yep. lots of other churches. Go where you will connect and where you you know, you know, feel more comfortable. But mm. we want to be true to who we are. Yeah. And, and people who go, yeah, I want to be part of that vision, that mission, they'll come yeah. and be part of it. And that's the sort of people you want to be journeying with. And other people, they'll say, no, nah, that's not for me, but there's a church down the road and they'll go and do it there. And yep. it's the same, I guess, with accounting firms, businesses. Well, you'll, you'll welcome well, everyone. Hey, come. Oh, if absolutely. you want to hang out with us, we're here to hang out welcome, with us. For sure. But also just know that we're not going to change what we do to fit you. Yeah, yeah. And same with us. Hey, like this, like this, So, for example, we use a piece of technology called Zero. It's an accounting firm. We don't use QuickBooks or MyUp. We don't use it. So if you knock on my door and you say, hey, I use MyUp, we're like, that's awesome. Um, we don't actually look after you for that. Oh, but can you? I really want to work. Unfortunately, no. But I know a great person over there that uses that. Yeah. So, hey, uh, I, I really wish you guys could blah, blah, blah. Look, I really appreciate that. And we always listen and we're learning and we're developing. But that's that's kind of just not the environment we have here. Mm. I know a great church around the corner that is all about that kind of yep. stuff. Yep. Would you like me to connect you? Yeah, um, sure. Because if we have to constantly change everything we do, we never have a vision, mission. We never have an actual foundation that we built there. Yep. And the people in your congregation, the people in your small group, they'll never feel rooted in anything. Mm. They'll just feel like they're swaying and running everywhere. Yeah. Although I do get massively frustrated the fact there's like a bazillion churches around <laughs> because I didn't like how that song was played and yep. I prefer it with, uh, with an acoustic him, guitar. Of course, it's too loud. It's not loud enough. Just think of the impact yep. we could have if we just got over ourselves. Yeah. And just said, you know what? There's a much bigger purpose out here than me. Yep. And what does it look like if I, if we try to do this thing together, mm-hmm. respecting our individuality and differences? Yeah, unity on diversity, working hand. Oh, hand. Yep. Just so much impact we could make as a community, yep. isn't there? And I think you know the way when people look at churches and they see people squabbling over silly things, it makes it worse. It wrecks your whole witness, doesn't it? it does. like when they see people that love one another despite their differences and yep. they work with one another. I think that's a really powerful witness. So Agree. Yeah, we're preaching from the same book, mate. That's well great. Done. Excellent. So um, last question before we do some quick fire questions. Yeah. Um, we've preached recently, talked about Ephesians 4, which is, you know, Christ gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Yeah. I think um, the apostolic gift that people have is that gift is to step out into a new territory, mm-hmm. you know, to cross the boundary, to expand the mission, um, to do that sort of thing. And I think that's not just for one hour on a Sunday. I think people are gifted apostolically to to do new things. And I think it's pretty clear you've got that sort of gifting on your life. So uh, what would you say to people who are thinking about starting something new? Maybe they've had this idea for ages, they think they can do it, but they just haven't stepped Mm -hmm. out. You've obviously learned so much, particularly in the last eight years. What would you say to someone who's there on the edge of the cliff, about to step out? (laughs) Don't do it. (laughs) This is what I do in my day, do- day job. I work predominantly with people with ideas. Mm. Um, so there's a whole bunch of ways I can I can dice this up. We can look at it from a perspective of a business idea and you play the friends, families and fools first. You test it in the market. You understand, it has it got legs? Is there people who are not my friends who want to be a part of this? And if so, then maybe I can go and do more. Mm. But maybe we can talk about something totally different of that. And it's like I just feel there's something I want to go and do and something I want to achieve. Um, once again, who around you will give you honest feedback on that? Mm. And then who around you doesn't know you? That Like who can you go to that you don't know? Because sometimes, you know, when you're too familiar with someone, mm. they don't listen to everything, they don't understand anything, and they put assumptions on, oh, no, look, you can't do that, mate. You wear glasses. Mm. Um, you, you can't wear glasses when you do that. Oh, you, But hold on, you didn't even let me explain what I was going to try and do. Um so I think you definitely need to have two different perspectives. You need to have someone who knows you well, but someone who doesn't, but understands that space. Yeah, okay. um, that gives you perspective on what you should do. Now, is this something that people actually want? Is there a problem out there that you're trying to solve? And is anyone currently solving it? And if someone's currently solving it, are they solving it well or not well? Because are you just opening another church next door because you want to play with a banjo instead of the acoustic guitar? Yep. Or are you doing it because there's actually something to be solved here? Mm-hmm. MacGyver it, right? Yep. Like what are we trying to solve here? Yep. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing that I've seen. There, like, and, and forgive me if anyone's listening to this and they have just started doing this. But if you think you're the first person that's making soy wax candles with scented things... <laughs> <laughs> You're not. Now, yep. that might still be something that gives you joy mm. and makes you happy and keeps you busy and provides a bit of income. But you're not changing the world. Mm. You're not solving any problems. Mm. So I guess you need to understand is like, am I trying to solve a problem 
or am I trying to give myself some joy? Yeah. If I'm trying to give myself some joy, the way you approach it needs to be very, very different. You need to you need to be more probably inward focused. This is what makes me happy as long as I'm not hurting people at making me happy. Mm. If there's a problem you're trying to solve, you need to look at the scale of that solution. Yeah. Is this a, there's 100 people in my neighborhood who are not eating well and I want to feed them and this is how I can go about it? Or is there there's billions of people in this world that are not eating well and I need to solve that? Mm. Who, are you, who are you trying to help? And then focus on that solution. Yeah, it's very good. I really like that. Like I think about church planting, for example, and my big bugbear with that is that some churches just go, they assume if they're not there, nothing's happening. Mm. So they just cruise into the neighborhood. They plant a church opposite in someone else's church. Someone else's church. They're and not many <laughs> different. They're doing things exactly the same except their jeans are skinnier and they've got more tats and it's more appealing. So everyone just flocks from that church to that church. The community hasn't changed. It's just the sheep have changed pastures. Yep. And I think that collaborative kind of um, approach where you, you go into an area, you look there and you say, is there a need here? Yeah. Um, there might be several churches but they're not kind of the church that we are. That Maybe they don't. They're not looking to help the homeless in the local area and, and we have a real sense that that's what God's calling us to do. Mm. So we can come in there, we can complement, we can work together, we can maybe even join them in some of the projects they're doing that are different mm. and they can come and join us and the whole community's become better because yeah. we've collaborated, we've we've thought about what we can uniquely bring Absolutely. when meeting a, a problem or bringing a solution and, and I love that. And, and is it a real problem? Like, yeah, your three mates have got the problem yep. but like is it a real problem? Mm. And what are you what are you giving up to solve this problem? Yeah. And so I got a good mate of mine who um, is in a very well paid job, uh, and about a year or two ago, that what, he was in a well paid job that didn't require him to do much. Like mm. he had time, and he wanted to change the world. He's magnus opus or whatever the heck you call it. And he's like, I want this. To, I need my thing. Something I can put a stake in the ground. I can say this is what I stood for in my life, and my work's not. I think I need to find a new job. And I'm like, dude, you're getting paid well. And you have free time. Mm. What are you storm. doing with your time? Mm. Like you're in a position where you have influence, where you can do things, where you can set up. So sometimes it doesn't have to be the thing that you do in your day job to make the difference. Sometimes it's the thing you do in the three hours a day that you have spare that makes the difference. Yeah, yeah. And and I think for, for, for people, they, they think they have to be more because this is what society tells us. Mm. You need to be on stage. You need to be on the thing. You need to, you need to look big and glossy and drive a fast car and do all these things. Um, but maybe you don't. Mm. Maybe you can make more impact. Maybe you can help more people. Maybe you can do more from your couch yep. by sending a text message to someone mm. and saying, how you doing? Because you haven't done that in six months. Yep. Instead, you want to go and create a social media platform that connects to everybody who's feeling sad. Mm. Like what's the steps to get you there? Yeah. Baby steps first. Solve it small, solve it big, and then think about your scale. Yeah, very good. All right, well, we finish with quick fire questions. All right, I'll keep it short. Three for you. Most helpful book that you've read on leadership or business? I'm really not a good reader. Um, probably the the one that I can think of that I, I often refer to is um, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Okay. Um, it's by Cal Newport. Yep. Um, and the whole idea of it is if you in, in order to build a position, you do become an expert. How do you become an expert to something so that you actually can start to control and make decisions that are impactful? So, for example, I become so good that you're like, hey, we'd like to give you a promotion. I'm like, don't worry about the promotion. I'm going to work four days a week now yep. because I can do it in four days. But you're going to pay me the same amount of money. Mm-hmm. So it's that kind of – It's a really, I really enjoyed it. Okay, very good. If you could summarize the driving force of who you are and all you do with one word, what would it be? Misfit. Misfit. Beautiful. Number three, in one sentence, describe for us the legacy you'd like to leave when all is said and done. God. They're easy questions, right? <laughs> I'm glad you to repeat it. In no. one sentence, describe for us the legacy you would like to leave when all is said and done. The, f- the first thing that came to my mind was mum was proud, which is just like a, <laughs> like a me just thinking, silly, like, you know, you go, oh, as long as mum will be happy, we'll be fine. Um, but she's always the one going, are you sure? Um, I, can't, I can't even put it into words. Yep. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. No worries. Le- le- uh, legacy, legacy. Give me like, something to think about as you go away. Yep. What do yep. you want on your gravestone? You know, what, what do you want people to remember, those sort of things? I, to um, be honest, I don't care about people remembering me. Yeah. Like I think I'd rather them remember what they have achieved than me. Yeah. Like why do I need to be remembered? There's no, there's no, there's no benefit of that. Yeah. That's good. Well, that probably answers the question. Yeah, that's good. That. Who was this guy again? Yep. <laughs> that, that bloke, but yeah, he's made a difference. That's good. 
Okay, so if people are interested in knowing more about Illuminate, how do they find you? Um, look, you can chase us uh, uh, online, Illuminate, I-L-L-U-M-I-N-8.com.au. You'll find myself, Andrew Van D. Beek, um, on LinkedIn is where I talk a lot, or on Twitter. Um, Illuminate has Facebook pages and all those things as well. Um, and if you want to follow some of the other funky things we do, um, Big Little Brush is the bamboo toothbrush social project. Buy a toothbrush, save 600 years of plastic pollution, and we'll give all the money to indigenous culture um, and community in the country. And the Rumble, R-U-M-B-L.com, um, is a little side project of mine where I take people away out of their comfort out of, I call it out of their comfort and into their zone mm. um, where we, we try to shake a few things up because I believe that everybody is capable of achieving what they need to. They just need to be in the right environment for it. Sounds fascinating. It's Mate, fun. Thank you so much for tonight. It's been uh, kind of riveting to talk to you about that and uh, your business and to hear, you know, such a unique perspective. Mm, so thanks, I really man. appreciate the time, mate. Thanks for being a guest on the As One Leadership Podcast. Awesome. It's been great. Anyway, thanks. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the As One Leadership Podcast, getting you in the room with experienced leaders so you can grow and thrive in leadership. This podcast is hosted by Luke Williams and brought to you by Follow Baptist Church. If you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. Your feedback will help us grow further and bring new insightful content to you. For those watching on YouTube, Please like this video, leave a comment, and subscribe to the Follow Church channel. Ultimately, if you found this episode valuable, please share it with others who can also benefit from it. We can't wait to share more experiences and knowledge in our next episode, From Melbourne to the World.